Hello, everyone. Um, I love being here in the Paley Center. And even though there are so many of us in this room, it still feels like a very uh, intimate group. And I, even though the lights are down, I just wanted to start by getting a show of hands of the people here. How many know nothing about TM, Transcendental Meditation? Good for you. So this is kind of going to be your TM 101. How many are medical and mental health professionals? And of those hands, how many are using TM right now in your patients? Interesting, right? And uh, how many are in recovery or on your own journey yourselves in addiction or substance abuse? Good, welcome. So I think we're going to have a, a really amazing uh, series of conversations. And I do hope they are conversations. But I wanted to start by sharing really my experience with TM, uh, and in particular with the David Lynch Foundation, because I, I think for those of you who don't know anything about Transcendental Meditation, uh, some of these experiences that I had may, may resonate with you. I, um, like many, are pretty type A, I would say. Very, <laughs> very, very type A. Very, <laughs> big, <laughs> big, big A. Yeah. Um, and I had wanted to learn meditation for years because I had covered it in the media. I had read about it myself just as a woman, as a mother, as a doctor. Um, and I felt that I, just as an individual, was kind of covering all the bases from the neck down in, in my wellness routine. Uh, I was making sure I got seven to nine hours a night of sleep. Arianna Huffington would be so proud. Uh, <laughs> I was getting exercise six out of seven days a week. I thought my diet and nutrition was really on point. This was really the only piece of the puzzle that I hadn't gotten to yet. And in covering it as much as we do in the media, I was reading all about different types of meditation and mindfulness. And I would read the following almost all the time. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Anyone can do it. Just do it. Now, for a type A, that doesn't sit well with me because there has to be a way to do it. So um, I just delayed and delayed and delayed. And I said, if there isn't a formal instruction, I, this isn't for me. Finally, through a series of, I can only say, cosmic, meaningful events, I kept on hearing David Lynch Foundation, TM, TM, TM. And as you'll hear soon um, from Elizabeth Vargas and our ABC family, a lot of our colleagues uh, have practiced and learned transcendental med meditation. And finally, I said, this is it. It's a sign. I'm going to go. And it's perfect for me because there are lessons involved. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I took the four quick, easy day of lessons, started to do it. As Bob says, I think, often, uh, to try it for two weeks. If you don't feel a difference, discontinue it. And I remember when we talked about that, and you said, no one discontinues. So I thought, wow, that's pretty good. From a medical and scientific, 100%, that's, that's excellent. And so I started doing it. And it was I can only characterize it under the doctor heal thyself umbrella, because it wasn't necessarily my patients uh, or my colleagues who noticed a difference first. It was my teenage daughter who said almost immediately, I said, you know, you should think about learning because a lot of teens are doing this, and I think you'd enjoy it. And she started asking me questions about it. And I said, do you see a difference in me? And I, this had been, I think, one or two weeks in for me. And she said, oh. <laughs> 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 I, and I said, well, how bad was I before? <laughs> and she said, you were a little tense, Mom, <laughs> a little tense. And I think, all kidding aside, that, that's very, very important with you know, Bob saying we're really all at risk um, in some way, because I didn't think I was tense. I didn't think I was stressed. I, didn't, I wasn't practicing or learning TM to deal with a problem or an issue in my life. I wanted to ac accentuate the positives. And it was only after, you know, how kids are um, that she said, yeah, you were, uh, you were pretty, uh, pretty wound, mom, that I realized uh, the difference. And I can only say, uh, for those of you, again, who are just kind of learning the TM 101 today, that um, it, it has been a game changer for me. And I think that with everything that I do in my professional life, my personal life, it's not about finding that time. It's about making that time. And it's a pleasure to make that time every day. 
um, and I feel more mentally energetic, and it's just been great. So I hope you enjoy hearing from everyone today. I think you will, and I think it'll be a great dialogue. So we're going to bring up our first, where am I sitting, Bob, on that end? or that this? End. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce you to our, our first panelist, Elizabeth Vargas. She's an award-winning ABC News anchor. I'm sure many of you uh, know her work. She's covered breaking news stories, reported in-depth investigations, and conducted true newsmaker interviews. She's currently the co-anchor of 2020 with David Muir. Elizabeth Vargas was previously co-anchor of World News Tonight, anchor of World News Tonight Sunday, news anchor and frequent co-host on Good Morning America, where she and I often work together, correspondent for 2020 and Primetime Thursday, and co-anchor of Primetime Monday. She's a big deal. <laughs> she joined ABC News from NBC News, where she was a correspondent and anchor, primarily for Dateline NBC and The Today Show. And I'm really proud to say that Elizabeth is not just a colleague, but a friend. So please welcome Elizabeth. And she has a book coming out. Oh, yes. Thank you. And we, we channeled each other today. It's the ABC right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a way too long an intro, by the way. Like, not not and, long and enough. And you have a book coming out. I do. Which is very exciting. Um, which is on topic. It's, uh, it's called Memoir. It's a memoir called Between Breaths, a memoir of anxiety and addiction. And in it, I talk about uh, meditation and how that is one of my tools in my toolbox that's really helped me with, with both. I mean, so... Did you practice TM before, or when did you start? Tell Just a year ago. Oh. I, I started a year ago when I, I was, um, while Robin Roberts was away, um, she was suffering, getting uh, with a, yet another bout with cancer. And so I filled in for her for a year on Good Morning America hosting and sat next to George every morning for five days a week. And Stephanopoulos. George Stephanopoulos. <laughs> Sorry, I just assume right, everybody right. knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> That's right. Um, and he is so notoriously and infamously very disciplined, but he told me he did transcendental meditation twice a day, right. um, getting up at like 2.30 in the morning in order to do it, and I thought he was absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Um, but after I, uh, after I got back from rehab and was hosting the show with him, uh, he encouraged me to try it. So he set me up with Bob, who taught me how to do it. I, I do not do it all the time, twice a day. I will, I'm going to totally Neither admit. Neither do I. It's very, I, I was telling Bob, I just saw, I love the show Billions, and I was watching an episode <laughs> recently, and... And Damian Lewis, who played Bobby Axelrod, was in one scene looking at his phone, trying very hard to meditate, and kept like opening an eye and checking the time. And that rang a little true for me. I mean, there are times, one time I did forget to push the app on my phone, and I sat there meditating and meditating. I thought, surely this is. And I mean, it was. I went 40 minutes. <laughs> But um, so anyway, I try. So you mentioned George, and um, before we talk a little bit more about what, really what TM is, uh -huh. I just want to echo your George stories um, by, by sharing something that I had heard about George, it's very, very similar to what you just said, which is I too sometimes can have difficulty getting that 20 minutes in the morning in. Mm -hmm. and it's so ironic because you know you feel better when you start your day like that, but it, it requires planning like so many other things. So I had seen Bob at an event in Austin in the fall, and I said, I, I really, um, I kind of dropped the ball a little bit for about three or four weeks, and I was very sporadic, and because I've been on GMA almost every morning, and I, you know, and Bob said, what time? do you think George Stephanopoulos wakes up in the morning? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, no, I know. I mean, everyone knows he gets up at like 3 in the morning. And he said, well, what time do you wake up when you do GMA? And I said, 5. <laughs> and then I said, never mind. I got the answer to that question. So it is all relative, I think. But, Bob, speak a little bit about specifically how TM differs from other types of meditation and mindfulness, because I think this is really the, that's the tip of the iceberg, really. When, I, when we talk about meditation, in brief, when we talk about meditation, I like to use a, a metaphor. And that is you're on a little boat, and you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You've heard this before. And all of a sudden, you get these huge waves, 30, 40 foot swells. And you could rightfully think, oh my gosh, the whole ocean is in upheaval. But the word whole is a bit of an exaggeration. Because if you could do a cross section out there, you'd realize you've got these little itty-bitty 30-foot waves, but the ocean in reality is a mile deep. 
and you got this turbulence on the surface, but the depth of the ocean is always silent, pretty darn silent. And that's analogous to our mind. Surface of our mind is the active thinking, gotta, 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 gotta do this, and I gotta do all the gottas. And it's a natural human desire to say, oh, I'd like to have some inner calm, some inner clarity, some inner peace, some inner resilience. And the operative word there is inner. And with transcendental meditation, we hypothesize, because I want to make the point, there's nothing to believe in. The great thing about TM, there's no shtick. There's no belief. You can be 100% skeptical, and it works fine. But we hypothesize that every one of us has a level of our mind deep within that is already calm and settled and wide awake. And transcendental meditation is a simple, simple, simple technique that anyone can learn, even me, <laughs> can learn that allows your active, agitated thinking mind to settle down to that inner calm, access that inner calm. And when that happens, your body gains a state of rest in many regards deeper than sleep. And just briefly, because we'll hear more from Dr. Rosenthal, cortisol levels, which are uh, a hormone associated with anxiety, cortisol levels drop 30 to 40 percent, indicating a profound reduction in, in stress and anxiety. How it differs from other forms of meditation, which was your original question? <laughs> Bob, you can <laughs> bring it back. Bob. I knew you would get there. <laughs> yeah. there are, according to science, there's three basic types of meditation, according to research now. We used to think all meditations were the same. Turns out it's not the case. Brain research and research on cardi um, cardiovascular effects of different meditations show there's three basic types of meditation. One is called focused attention, and that's a concentration form of meditation where we're really trying to clear our mind of thoughts. It's like trying to stop waves on the surface. That's easy. It's like trying to stop thoughts. That's less easy. <laughs> uh, the, the second is called open monitoring or mindfulness, and that's an observational tool. It's often taught as part of a treatment regimen for for recovery, and that's a, f a wonderful coping tool, and that's, as I said, observational, watching your thoughts, just watching the waves rise and fall, observing your moods and feelings in the environment. And transcendental meditation is not concentration, and it's not observational, it's actually accessing a level of calm deep within everyone. And I like to say to people, because people say to me, well, I do mindfulness, and I love mindfulness, and I say, it's not either or. Not like it's not either or. There are tools in the toolbox, and what outcome we want. And I always say add, just add. So you take that in the first thing in the morning. You settle down and access that deep calm. Body is freed from stress. You're energized. You're naturally more mindful. And if during the day things get intense, you have a mindfulness tool. I think that clarifies a lot because when people first start hearing about meditation, it, it all becomes interchangeable, or you know, or, or so many people think, and it, there really are these important completely different. It's like saying three pills because they are called medicine are all the same, or yep. exercise, yeah, right. and there's different types. Elizabeth, you've been so open about your struggle and your recovery, which is but one of the many things that I admire about you. Um, but can you share with us how, I know anxiety played a big role in your life, um, in your career, in your professional life, and as well as your personal life, even before you went into rehab. Talk a little bit about that, because it's almost like a preview to your book, but, but in how TM helped you with the anxiety part of what you were going through. Well, um, I've been anxious since I can remember. I mean. Um, I, I think I was born anxious. I, my earliest memories are infused with anxiety. Um, my dad went to Vietnam when I was six years old, and that's when I started having daily, full-blown panic attacks. Um, and oddly enough, I mean, at that point, I was very moved in that video, by the way, of the, vet, of the mm -hmm. veteran. That's the one that really got to me, I think, pro pro probably because of my personal connection. But at that point, they weren't even helping the vets with PTSD at all. They obviously weren't helping their kids. Right. Um, and nobody uh, ever, you know, I didn't tell anybody about it. I was ashamed of my anxiety. I thought it was something to be, to hide, and I didn't tell anyone. Um, and even though I was having these, like, full-out panic attacks, nobody said, what's wrong with you? Which is kind of unbelievable to think about, but it's mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. But which, which gave me the message, hide this, it's shameful. It's interesting, though, as I, as, as I reached adulthood, um, when I would go talk to a doctor, 
And first of all, doctors don't ask you about anxiety. Right. And it took, a, it took me years and years and years to screw up the courage to tell somebody I felt anxious. And then once I told a doctor I felt anxious, I was given a prescription. And so nobody's treating what's causing the anxiety. They're just treating the symptoms of the anxiety. And eventually, you know, in adult life, in the last decade, I turned to alcohol as a way to soothe my anxiety. I'm also in a very, we both are, a high stress um, business. My, my therapist once said to me, for somebody who's got lots of anxiety, you, you, you are on live television in front of eight million people every night. Like, you know, why did you pick something so high stress? And I don't know the answer to that either. I got a lot more therapy to do. Um, but, you know, when I was in, um, uh, at rehab, I did go to rehab, um, and recovery is something, as people in this room who, who are in recovery know, it's not something you accomplish and then you're like, ta-da, I'm done. It's a daily um, effort, much like meditating. Mm -hmm. um, and mindfulness works temporarily in that moment. Mindfulness, and for me, yoga breathing would work on an airplane when I'm having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. um, TM works for me on a more global, well-being 24-7 level. And I still struggle with, I must be doing this wrong because it's so simple. <laughs> like I, I asked Bob over and over again, okay, I must, I'm missing something, I'm not doing it right. Um, so it really has helped because for me, anxiety was when everything speeds up, it's so fast. And, uh, and, and I wanna run as fast as I can away from this feeling. And I'm gonna run away to, um, acting out to alcohol, to anything, to a f lashing out, to all sorts of unproductive behavior, or just plain sprint away. A and transcendental meditation helped me, it's one of many things I use, but helps you sort of unclench in that moment and slow down. Um, because if you can slow down long enough to think clearly, you can, you can realize and, and start to not only manage that panic, but understand that what you're so terrified of, what you are sprinting away from, isn't really that terrifying. It's historic and you can use a lot, it doesn't make it go away. But my anxiety is a lot less than it used to be. And when you were in rehab and seeing, I, I assume you're ongoing with your team mm -hmm. here in New York, they didn't suggest any TM? No. <laughs> no. I, I well, was, I, right? I, I did, there was a lot of mindfulness meditating. Um, there was a lot of, you know, where you sit and there's nothing, it, that's a tool too, but that doesn't last past that moment. Um, I found, uh, this is just my personal experience. I found that mindfulness meditation could help in that moment slow down, um, but it doesn't, once you're done with your mindfulness, you know, three minutes or five minutes, I'm right back to where I was. So um, I did do a day-long meditation retreat um, when I was in rehab that I loved. And that was what made me realize, oh, I kind of like this. Mm -hmm. This is kind of cool. And we did silent meditations. We did, uh, it was like a, we couldn't talk for a whole half a day, which for me was epically hard. <laughs> um, walking meditation, which I loved. And, I, and I've given this to a, my senior producer at 2020 who's got a lot on her plate feeling very anxious and stressed, and I said, you know what, go out for a walk with each step, say, may I be calm, may I be healthy, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, Love may that. I be calm, may I Love be, it. you know, just do that. And it's just a way of, like, it's not TM, but it's a way of like, <sighs> it well, means, it's an exhale, it's a big exhale. The thing is, the word meditation just means thinking. So you can have walking meditation, which is thinking something when you're walking, and you can have mindfulness meditation, which is observing your thoughts, and you can have concentration meditation, which is concentrating, so these are all fine. Transcendental meditation means to transcend thinking, to, to go beyond that agitated mm, to, the, to access levels of the mind that are already there that are deeply calm and settled and wide awake. And I think that's an important point. People say to me, I could never clear my mind of thoughts. You know, I'm, anybody ever have that thought? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't quiet my mind. Who can? It's not, it's not stopping this, it's accessing this. And that's the difference. And the beautiful thing is when you start, it takes about an hour or so a day over four days, and then there's a lifetime follow-up program, which 
Jennifer and I have followed up with, and Elizabeth and I are now going to follow up with. But just to sort of get you back, and just to treat he harasses me. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, do I? Do I? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> but that analogy, that metaphor of you know, I'm a scuba diver, and actually that is what happens when yeah. we would when we would dive on rough waters. That, and you're getting seasick, and you know, the, I would be the first off the side of the boat, and you go down as quickly as you can, because just 10 feet down, the water is so much oh. calmer. And that really helped me, like, okay, so that's what I'm trying to do consciousness-wise. I wanna thank you again and again and again for being so open and, and really being a role model for people, not just in, in our profession, but really anyone who's struggling with addiction or substance abuse, because I know it hasn't been easy, but you have handled it with such strength and grace, and I so admire that. And your book is called what? Between Breaths. Between Breaths. I'm, so I'm you, meditating between breaths. So I know that there are a lot of psychiatrists in the room, but as a gynecologist, when I heard the title, at first I thought you said between breasts. And I, I thought, oh, how nice. Wait, maybe you should change it. I'll probably sell more copies if I call it that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I think that that, Bob, that you talked about and that Elizabeth mentioned with the scuba analogy, I think having that kind of visual yeah. uh, understanding of what TM is is so helpful, I think. For it's not that we visualize it during meditation. It's that right. we just access that quiet. And what, uh, you know, some, one time someone said to me, well, transcendental meditation, how do you know when your 20 minutes are up? And I said, <laughs> Look at your watch. I mean, it's not like you're going someplace. It's just you're settling down. You're just settling down. So it is my honor to uh, invite and welcome to the stage our next two distinguished panelists. And first is Dr. Norman Rosenthal, who is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine. He's conducted research at the National Institutes of Mental Health as a research fellow, researcher, and senior researcher for more than 20 years. And he was the first psychiatrist to describe and diagnose season affective disorder, which we know about, SAD. R Dr. Rosenthal is the author of more than 200 scholarly articles, as well as books for the general public, including Winter Blues and the Emotional Revolution. And relevant to this discussion, he's the author of the best New York Times bestselling book, Transcendence, and also a new book that's coming out, and I think you have an announcement about it, on May 17th called Supermind, which is really looking at the research and the experiences of transcendental meditation practice over weeks, months, and years. So Dr. Norman Rosenthal and your friend. And here's a man in my 44 years of teaching who declared to me when I was sitting across at a uh, cafe, I was going, there. Both these guys are friends. He said, I'm the most skeptical person you're ever going to try and teach. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> uh, Dr. Richard Friedman is professor of clinical psychiatry and director of the psychopharmacology clinic. He spent at uh, Weill Cornell Medical School. He specializes in anxiety and mood disorders and has an expertise in psychopharmacology and refractory depression. Dr. Friedman is also actively involved in clinical research of mood, mood disorders. In particular, he's involved in several ongoing randomized clinical trials of both approved and investigational drugs for the treatment of major depression, chronic depression, and dysthemia. And he is also an op-ed, what is it? Op-ed writer. <laughs> no, I know, but you were a col science <laughs> columnist, but now an op-ed writer for the New York Times. You probably read his columns on a regular basis. Please welcome Richard Friedman. <laughs> So, gentlemen, this is, um, I was very, very excited about this part of our program because there are a lot of hardcore scientists and skeptics and physicians in the room, and some of them know nothing about the data or the history regarding TM. So, Norm, start, if you can, by giving us a little historical perspective, just briefly, on TM in the specialty of psychiatry and where we've, how far we've come, really. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, the research in TM really began in the 70s here. And Maharishi, who brought the technique from uh, India into the West and elsewhere in the world, 
um, actually was a physicist by training and encouraged research. So one of the reasons I got so excited about the technique was because of really hundreds of controlled studies in many areas, including areas that impact on psychiatry, such as anxiety. There's a terrific meta-analysis done even in the late 80s showing multiple studies in which TM was superior to other kinds of stress-reducing, relaxing techniques. So I think that we've known for a long time, relevant to this particular subject that we're talking about, even in the mid-90s, there were 19 controlled studies related to drug and alcohol abuse uh, where TM was vastly superior, including some very good controlled studies. So from a mental health point of view, there is already ample research, not to say there couldn't be always more and better, but uh, it's really well grounded in science. So then Richard, this of course begs the question, if there is all this data, why, in your opinion, has it taken so long to really become, if not the gold standard, at least an adjunct to the gold standards in, in the field of psychiatry and treating depression, anxiety, and of course, substance abuse and addiction? Right, it's a wonderful question. So I would say one of the issues is, of course, it's much easier, or so most people think it's much easier to just take a pill. You know, uh, well, that's what Elizabeth said. Or, or you know, whether it's a prescribed drug or it's a you know drug of abuse, it's just very, very immediate reduction of anxiety and dysphoria and depression. So it's really fast. And yet, TM is as Bob has told everybody, you know, effortless, easy. Um, it takes very little time and it has huge effects. So I think it's a cultural thing, you know, on the part of the field, but a sort of an emotional bias on the part of the public that you know people want an immediate fix. They want something which is really quick. Um, on the other hand, as I say to my residents and I say to my patients, this is one of the only treatments that has no side effects. You know, placebos have side effects, drugs have side effects, TM doesn't have side effects, and it makes people feel better rather quickly. So I think it's a cultural thing, and I think it's because we as a country and as a society believe you have to be happy and stressed. You have to be productive <laughs> and stressed. This is a ridiculous disjunction. You, know, you have to do these two things together. Um, and so what that means is people have to have a way to either turn themselves on or off, lower their anxiety, ramp themselves up, ramp themselves down. So we're by default a pill-popping country. It's, our, it's the way we think. Or self-medicating. Yeah in one way or the other. If yeah. I might just add, there are also billions of dollars from the pharmaceutical industry <laughs> that are pushing the medical treatments of things direct to consumer advertising, persuasion of doctors through all kinds of freebies and incentives and educational elements. And when you've got that kind of advertising against something that is you know, people complain about the cost of learning TM, but it's so trivial compared to the cost of being on some of these very expensive medicines. Sure. So that's a big factor. What about if you both could, or one of you, explain, explain to people here, really from the physiologic standpoint, the thinking of how TM works specifically for mood disorders like anxiety or depression, because Bob mentioned the reduction in cortisol, but explain if you can a little bit about what's known about the mechanism of action of TM. Right, well, one thing that's really interesting is that in people who are anxious and depressed, especially people who are depressed, there's an imbalance in the activity between two major regions of the brain that if you think about you know, your executive brain, your prefrontal cortex where you know, the thinking and the planning takes place, that's the part of your brain that can basically evaluate should I do A or B, or is what I did really bad, or am I as bad as I think I am? <laughs> you know, and that's in battle against the limbic system, you know, which encodes emotion and things like anxiety and fear. And if the limbic system is too active and the prefrontal cortex is inactive, you end up with a state of anxiety and depression. Um, that's a primitive way of putting it, but the balance between these two brain centers is off and the circuits are not 
communicating in the way that's best for you. And one of the things that you can do with TM is to lower your level of anxiety. It is to sort of quiet down the limbic system and actually increase the activity of your prefrontal cortex to basically inhibit these inappropriate worries and anxieties. So you can actually change the balance between these two regions in the circuit. And that's been shown with functional MRIs. It, it's, it's been shown with functional MRI for medicine and psychotherapy. I, Norm would know actually whether it's been shown with F MRI with TM. Well, what I would say is that absolutely as Richard said, but corresponding to those changes in the brain, we see changes in the body's response, the sympathetic fight or flight responses. Uh, we heard Elizabeth saying a feeling of overreaction to things that maybe don't need such powerful reactions. Well, what they've done, uh, and they've used TM versus controls, is they've exposed people to alarming signals, like very loud noises or violent images. And then they've looked just at the skin response, which is an output of the sympathetic nervous system. And what they've shown is in meditators, there's a crisp response that rapidly comes down to baseline. Whereas in non-meditators, the response is slow, and then there's several false alarm bleeps I'll, after that. I'll ask you a two-part question. Uh, where do you hope to see TM in the field of psychiatry, especially with respect to substance abuse and addiction, but also anxiety and depression? Where do you hope to see it in a year, in five years, in 10 years? And how likely do you think that is? I would like to see insurance reimburse everybody who needs TM. For anxiety disorders, for substance abuse, for alcohol recovery, for recovery from all addictions. That's what I would like to see. How likely it is to happen depends on us. The more we do, such as this wonderful symposium that we have now, the more of this kind of information is disseminated, the sooner that's going to occur. I agree. And Richard, in your experience, when, when you're working with patients who are either dealing with depression or anxiety or in recovery acutely, and you or someone suggests TM, what has been their response in general? I would say it's extremely positive. I mean, after all, what people really like is getting a tool where you're basically giving them the power to take control of something in their life that's upsetting. If I give you a pill and I make you feel better, when you stop the pill, you lose some of its protective effect over time. And we're always treating these chronic problems with anxiety and depression, let's say. But if I teach you a skill, like a psychotherapy, which is a form of learning, or I teach you TM, where I teach you how to deeply relax and you know, sort of come in contact with that, sub that, that substrata. I've given you a skill that when I'm done, when I just disappear, you've got and you carry with you. And people love this. And you know, I have to say in my practice, um, obviously as a gynecologist, I'm dealing with women of all ages, many of whom have uh, any range on the spectrum of anxiety to mild to incapacitating and certainly depression as well as substance abuse issues. Um, and I find really the gamut between people who say, I, I want to be on four psychotropic medications, the more everything, block everything that can be blocked and increase everything that can be increased and I'll feel better living through <laughs> pharmacology. And then I have the opposite who will say, and this is, I think, also a problem in the field of psychiatry and, and mental health in general, there's a stigma if I take that prescription. And I'll say, well, you know, it's 2016. <laughs> if you need a prescription, then you need a prescription, you know, whether that's short term or long term. But there's that middle ground, which I think is the majority of people, um, certainly women, who, for whom really TM or something that they could take control of themselves could be really kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. Norm, any? Yeah, well, I, I would say that I recommend TM to almost all my patients, and I have dozens of meditating patients. We talk about our meditation, and I've been giving these, you know, psychoactive medications for decades, and I still do, and I do when they're needed. And, you know, we, we are very much the better for having them but over the years, I've learned everything that medic medications cannot do. 
There are so many things medicines don't do, plus side effects that are really problematic. So I think that we really need to understand interventions like TM and what they can do to enable people to lower dosages, ameliorate side effects, and do things like expand consciousness that medicines can I, I agree do. with you. And Bob, mm -hmm. for what's going on, I know obviously the David Lynch Foundation is global, but here in this country, talk a little bit about what the foundation is doing specifically in terms of teaching TM to people in recovery. Actually, that's a perfect lead-in to our next panel. <laughs> natural segment. So we, that's, that's the way we can talk about that. Because more and more interest, more and more demand the idea that we have to give a per, we have to equip a person with a tool that's very simple to learn and actually you look forward to doing. And it, as Elizabeth so beautifully said, it, it spills over throughout the day. So we'll hear that that's a... Great. Well, I, I want to thank you, doctors, for uh, sharing those insights. And anyone who has access to uh, Medline Search, I mean, it's pages and pages and pages of really good peer-reviewed data on the benefits of transcendental meditation. So uh, congratulations for all your work, and thanks for sharing it with us. Taking a cue, actually, we are going to uh, break this discussion in, in half. We'll bring everybody on stage, at, but around around 2:04, we're going to be connecting with uh, Russell Brand uh, live from uh, London. He was unable to come and join us for this, but he was excited to um, speak to everyone and take our questions. So. Um, Bob Miller divides his time between two businesses. He's the chairman of the board for the Freedom Institute. I know many people here in New York City are aware of that. And the president and CEO of Miller Publishing Group. Bob's publishing career comprises his years at Time, Inc., where he served as publisher of Sports Illustrated and of Time Magazine, and an executive vice president there between 1974 and 1996, and his current position as the CEO of the Miller Publishing Group which is focused on niche media businesses. Bob was appointed chairman of the board of the Freeman Institute, Free, Freedom Institute in 2012. You come on up, Bob. <laughs> I, know this, I know this is an uncomfortable thing to say, but Bob and I are both from San Francisco and rabid San Francisco Giants fans. <laughs> <laughs> Go oh, Mets, wow. Yankees. There was one, one yep. person. And, and they're in town tonight. Yes. <laughs> I'm surprised you're not at the stadium. Tonight. Uh, yeah, tonight. <laughs> Cindy Feinberg. In 2010, Cindy f founded the Recovery Coach of New York, which is built on her, program, on her program based on the theory of holism. In 2015, she co-founded the International Recovery Institute, which is a school to train individuals to help those suffering with substance abuse. She is a faculty lecturer at Adelphi University, is on the board of Center of Motivation and Change in the Berkshires, and is the 2014 recipient of the Karen Addiction Profession, Professional of the Year. Yeah. And the next gentleman is actually the reason why we're here. Um, we were sit I had meditated with him, and we were talking afterwards, and we both sort of said, you know, we really need to bring this meditation to the field of recovery. And here we are. And Peter G. Dodge is the founder, board chairman, and the president of the Peter G. D. J. Peter G. Dodge Foundation, a philanthropic organization dedicated to helping people live lives free from the effect, effects of alcohol addiction. He's a successful entrepreneur who founded Hanover Research, one of the largest market research firms in the world, and GP Ventures, which provides funding to seed stage enterprises. Jan Grzynski is, Dr. Dr. Grzynski is the senior research scientist at Friends Research Institute, where he is engaged in a diverse portfolio of addiction treatment and recovery research. His research spans the spectrum of substance abuse problems, substance use problems from early intervention studies with youth to treatment research with populations characterized by high problem severity and complex comorbidities. 
Much of his work focuses on evaluating novel approaches that improve patient access, engagement, and outcomes, particularly among vulnerable and underserved groups. <coughs> so, Jan. <laughs> Basically, we're going to divide this into two sections. These two wonderful people are going to talk about their experience uh, with Transcendental Meditation and why they're um, bringing it to their, prescribing it, bringing it to their clients and organization, and then maybe after Russell, then we'll talk about a major study that's underway, funded by the Peter G. Dodge Foundation. So uh, this is really all about the clinical realm, the boots on the ground, so to speak. So Cindy, I want to start with you first. If you could, what is holism? Explain what that so means in your world. So in my world, it, with my company, what I like to do with my clients is I like to treat them body, mind, and soul, right? Because when you're in recovery, it's not just <coughs> about treating the addiction, the substance. It's about working with people nutritionally, exercise, treating them from the ground up because when people get into recovery, we have to work with them with everything because they've kind of lost their way. And so when I work with a client, I like to look at, so what are you doing in your life now? Do you know how to eat well? Do you know how to exercise? And, you know, getting back to everything. And so when we talk about meditation and quieting the mind, that's the, one of the first things that they have to start to do. Because like most of the panelists talked about already, you know, substances is a quick fix to anxiety. And so now we have to look at a holistic way of doing that. A whole person. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously, that's true in clinical medicine, of sure. course, as well. Um, how did you get interested in TM yourself, personally? So I had a meditation practice years ago, totally different type of meditation. And um, like, you know, a lot of people, it was working so well, I stopped. <laughs> uh, and I, I have that kind of mind, that's that gotta, 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 gotta mind. And um, I wanted to get back to a practice and my good friend Johnny Podell suggested that I meet Bob Roth. And uh, about a month ago, Bob and I met, and he trained me in TM. So you were a TM virgin until a month ago. I was. <laughs> I have to bring it back to gynecology. I, exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little GYN humor. <laughs> I was. And so how do you feel? Is it, isn't it like Bob said? You've, no one doesn't feel a difference, right? I do feel a difference, and I have to say, it, it, it has taken me a little while to get to the twice a day. And like Elizabeth, you know, a little bit of like the looking at the clock. And I met with Bob last week for a little bit of a touch-up, and I said to him, you know, I said, I really now, I, sh I put the timer on, I shut the phone, I'm really into it now. Now I do it with intention. And he said, what does that mean? I said, I'm really meditating. And I feel it. Like, it's in my bones. I feel it. And it's changed me. That's great. It becomes a priority. Rather than something we just stick in to our day, it becomes a, we, we prioritize it. And we talk about this when, when we're in schools, actually, that we send a message when TM is part of a school day, that we send a message to children that silence and quiet time is as important as memorization and that you have to have balance. And I think that's what Cindy was experiencing. But Bob, you, you also, I think, have an incredibly eloquent way of kind of setting, setting the stage for people who are, who are new to TM uh, or not new to TM by saying, you know, no expectations, which I right. think all of us ironically have echoed the same thing, which is, you know, when you're type A, you might whisper, I really do expect a lot from this, <laughs> like a lot. And you always say what, Bob? Because I love the big toe analogy. Oh, yeah. uh, though, actually it was uh, Maharishi, who is a, a physicist who brought Transcendental Meditation to the West. And um, I had taught a reporter to meditate. And the reporter was doing a story, an interview with Maharishi. And, and the reporter said, well, you know, Maharishi, sometimes my meditation seemed to be more on the surface and sometimes my meditation seemed to be deeper. Are the deeper ones better? And he said, no, both are good. And the reporter said, how's that possible? And Maharishi said, because even in a shallow dive, we get wet. 
<laughs> Which I love. And so it's okay. It's really okay. And people say to me, well, if this thing is so effortless, why does it take four days? And I said, well, New Yorkers, we don't do effortless. <laughs> we have to be reassured that it is that effortless. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Um, Bob, I want to turn to you. Before we talk about the Freedom Institute, uh, with your media expertise, and I, I think you're at as high as you can go in the country with your, with your media experience, what's your opinion about the way that the media has covered TM and meditation in general in the last several years as you've watched it kind of get coverage? Yeah. Um... Well, I, I think there's no question the last couple of years, um, you know, the media is, is doing a much better job of reporting um, the positive impact of, uh, of meditation in, uh, in a variety of areas. And, um, but, I, but I think, too, that that's, you know, Bob has a lot to do with that in the David Lynch Foundation. I mean, you know, all of the money and effort that, and, uh, that they've put against media and through their programs and the, uh, the money that they've spent um, in uh, bringing TM specifically to high-stress communities and the results. Um, because along with every one of the programs that they underwrite and support, uh, they demand that uh, research is part of it, so that they can actually track effectiveness. And um, so, when you're able to to report um, results in a in a very quantitative fashion, um, it makes it pretty easy for media to pick up and and report on. And and I think and we're seeing the results of all of that. Yeah. And Bob, you know, you talk about putting TM teachers across the country and across the world. How much does one teacher, one trained transcendental meditation teacher cost to deploy into a community? Well, it depends upon their age and if they have a large family or not. But <laughs> um, we are very fortunate to have a new generation of younger TM teachers who are coming out of college with master's degrees in education, for example, and they want to make an impact in the world. And so then they spend another several months in postgraduate level training and they become a certified, it's very high level of certification to become a a TM teacher. It's not something just quick fix because they really qualified. And you know, anywhere fifty or sixty thousand dollars is starting starting salary. And then they can go out into schools or treatment programs. The I, I think I think right now the only obstacle we have, the demand is so huge, the only obstacle we have is enough trained teachers with that salary to, to support mm. them so they can mm -hmm. raise families. But these these two people have done right at the forefront of really bringing <laughs> meditation to their, I mean, that's what you're doing at the Freedom Institute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Bob, tell us a little bit about the Freedom Institute, because I think one of the things that I found so impressive and so necessary um, is the, the concept that someone in recovery, someone battling addiction or substance abuse, it's not just that one person. In, in fact, in medicine, it's never one person. It's their entire circle. And you've really pioneered that, uh, really, it's another form of holism, right, mm -hmm. Cindy, that holistic approach of incorporating their whole unit. Well, we try to. Um, we, we can't do that in every case. Um, um, everybody, uh, well, first of all, we're, uh, we're an outpatient facility, so we know the beds. And, um, but um, everybody who ends up in treatment at, at Freedom Institute is offered a free family session and, and encouraged to work with our family therapists who are specifically trained uh, in family therapy, systemic work. They're all Ackerman trained. Um, and, um, and some of them take advantage of that family therapy and some of them don't. What uh, percentage would you say? Is it half and um, half about? Or? I, I, in terms of actively engaged, um, I mean, uh, my guess is that over 50% have at least one family session, mm -hmm. but to, to, to continue it and, and make it part of their, it's probably uh, between 10 and 20% would be my guess. I think one of the things that Bob has done, Jennifer, is we, we've offered TM to your what, what's the situation? Now we're yeah. starting to roll it out with your clients. Yeah, so uh, briefly, um, so I, I, I too am in recovery. I'm eight years sober. Um, and How did you hear about it? Um, and then and six years ago, um, 
a friend here introduced me to Bob and the David Lynch Foundation, and, uh, and, and I was trained uh, in TM. And so I've been practicing Transcendental Meditation for six years. And I took over, uh, my mom founded Freedom Institute 40 years ago, um, but I, I took over the board four years ago. And, um, and Bob had been encouraging me to think about um, trying to bring TM into the, into re to the recovery community. And we'd been talking about how to do that. And uh, so a little bit less than a year ago, um, uh, my uh, chief clinical officer and, and I decided to uh, underwrite the training of our entire staff in TM because, mm -hmm. um, because we were thinking about, okay, how, how do we think about, how, how can we think about integrating TM into the work that we do? And, um, and Bob pointed out to me, you can't, you know, don't do it before you train your staff. And, uh, and so we, we, we did that as a first step. And because if your staff, if your clinicians don't buy into the benefits of TM, where do you go? And so we trained our staff about seven or eight months ago. All of them uh, took the coursework. All of them, I think, uh, reacted incredibly positively. Yeah, so th really then, it, then it, it became a matter of trying to figure out how do we go about doing it? And, um, and we just really, in the last couple of months, figured out an approach. And we've just started recently. Um, and, um, and we're doing it with, um, we're doing it with our, uh, uh, a population not in early recovery. Um, uh, the first, you know, so, so it would be people who have at least 10 to 12 weeks of sobriety. And, uh, and we've started, uh, we started introducing them to TM recently, and we've got uh, monitoring research going on. And so I, hopefully next year, if we do the summit again next year, I'll be able to report to you on that. Um, but it's really just a, a, a sort of a first step of trying to integrate it into the work that we do, and we'll see. I, great. I, I think great. this is one of the purposes of this, was to allow <clears throat> you to hear from from therapists like mm -hmm. Cindy, who is recommending it to her clients. And we've already started to teach, I think, the first right. person you yep. said. And that it can be incorporated first with your own staff and then making it available. So there's action steps that can be done, very concrete and very simple to introduce. It's not a complicated thing. And the other thing about it, though, is I like to say about Transcendental Meditation, it's not a mass meditation. It's not something that someone just comes in and you just say a few things and then, <laughs> and then you forget it you know, an hour later. It, it takes time. The, the problem of stress, the problem of anxiety, the problem of, of substance abuse is a serious, serious matter. And Transcendental Meditation is a substantive approach, antidote, tool. And so we take, when we go in, we take our time. We bring in highly qualified teachers and it has, it has a profound effect. So it's not a, a, a quick fix. Um, how are we doing with Mr. Brand? Oh, oh, we are ready. So we'll okay. stay up here. So I don't know if Russell, hi Russell, if you can hear me. Um, <laughs> that's Russell. <laughs> hi Russell. <laughs> you can see it over there too. Before you talk, I want to say one thing. Russell is a you know a wonderful actor and best-selling author and comedian. <laughs> it's true. But. Uh, seven years ago, I think, someone said to me in, in New York, I said, they said, you, Russell Brand wants to talk with you. He's interested in learning Transcendental Meditation. And they said, I'm not sure if he's serious about this. <laughs> so I said, I'm a big fan of his. I'd love to meet him. So I went to a hotel in a uh, lobby in, he's trying to remember the story, <laughs> in New York. And I, I looked at him right in the eyes. And I said, he said, uh, I'd like to learn Transcendental Meditation. And I said, how much time do you have? And Russell's eyes filled with tears, and he said, I've been searching for the timeless my whole life. I have as much time as you need to give me. Mm -hmm. And so Russell is a very dear friend and a brother. I love him very much and very grateful to you, Russell, to be here to answer a few questions and talk a little bit about Transcendental Meditation. And uh... <laughs> Well, now that I've discovered time, it's 10 minutes. <laughs> That's right. So Russell, 
when you when you made that call to Bob, um, it, share with us whatever you're comfortable sharing about why, how did that evolve? Why TM? Why not? some other form of meditation or mindfulness? And, and why at that time in your life did you, did you look for something? You're asking me why did I want to learn transcendental meditation? I, I believe in abstinence-based recovery. I believe in 12-step programs. Now, the 11th step of all those programs is to increase uh, our conscious contact with a higher power of our understanding through prayer and meditation. Prayer is when you communicate with your higher power. Meditation is when you listen to your higher power. What I have long understood, and in fact what I believe I was looking for through my continued excessive and abusive use of substances, was a different plane of consciousness, a different way of feeling. There are sort of like, I suppose, relatively prosaic explanations for, for that, like trying to escape pain trying to self-medicate, trying to anesthetize feelings. But beyond that, I believe that there is a yearning and urge for the transcendent. I think that that's what a lot of people with substance misuse issues are looking for. I know there are a lot of experts in the audience and a lot of uh, experts in that panel. My personal experience of addiction was that it was a kind of yearning, a kind of longing that I myself attempted to address through, uh, through alcohol and drugs. Now, when I got clean, I was left with the problems that left, led me to take drugs in the first place. I was left with the pain, the isolation, uh, the, the, the sort of sense of loss. And the, where transcendental meditation came in, because I don't think that transcendental meditation alone is sufficient to keep a person clean, but I found it to be an incredibly useful complement and an incredibly useful component to my own recovery and my own sobriety in that it gives me access to a different type of consciousness. Anyone who's an expert in the behavior and thinking of addicts will tell you it is their destructive, compulsive, obsessive thinking that leads them continually to misuse drugs and alcohol. Uh, the, these techniques or this specific technique of transcendental meditation is a way of addressing thought, of changing consciousness and I dare say you've had Norm Rosenthal in there at some point, still dining out on dark evenings. <laughs> <laughs> he will tell you that, that there are uh, uh, palpable, tangible, readable, neurological distinctions that occur in tr transcendent and meditative states. One of the first things that Bob told me that I liked was... But there is awake, there is sleep, there is dreaming, and there is meditation. And I think it is uh, no coincidence that one of the great pioneers of the dream medium, David Lynch, is uh, such a, a, an exponent of, of this technique because it's a new way of being human. As an artist, um, talk a little bit about the benefits that you found uh, just as a creative mind after you started practicing TM? Because I think certainly for in this, in this setting, we're talking really more about addiction and substance abuse, and there are a lot of psychiatrists and, and people in recovery in the audience here. But there are also a lot of people who want to learn TM not to deal with an issue that is potentially life-threatening, but to augment some positives in their life. And, and I know that you're an incredibly creative person, so did you notice a difference after you started practicing TM? I did, as a matter of fact. I suppose one way of looking at this issue is why would you be a pedestrian in your own consciousness? Why would you confine yourself to limited neurological pathways in this finite, individuated lifetime, why would you not experience as much of, of your own personal consciousness, if there is such a thing as personal consciousness, if there's something, uh, because what I sometimes think you experience is impersonal consciousness, consciousness beyond your own individual consciousness. Um, I, I think that it, it has massively affected my creativity. I mean, one of the so it can be somewhat counterproductive. As Bill Hicks once said about marijuana, it, you can do everything you normally do just as well. You just realize it's not worth the fucking effort. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes with transcendental meditation, 
there are such the, the, you're exploring the infinite within yourself. The idea of picking up a paintbrush can seem quite tawdry. But, like, but certainly it gives you access to different aspects of your mind. Certainly it gives you a different perspective. And perspective is everything. And you have a, many millions of fans that are quite young and at risk for uh, high risk behaviors of all sorts, but certainly substance abuse and addiction. Uh, have you thought about, I, you've, I know you've been very active with the David Lynch Foundation, which is so admirable and so important and impactful, but what's your opinion on that younger population and what they're facing right now and what role something like TM could have? My sense is, is that as materialism, in a very literal sense, reaches a kind of critical mass, as we seek to externalise pleasure, as we identify continually with external stimuli, we need to counterbalance it with a new and more powerful phenomenon. But interestingly, young people, I think, you know, I don't see them as a kind of less formed uh, entity than, like, a... Than, Adults, I mean, a lot of young people that I deal with now seem to have a really intuitively have a, a great grasp of the principles of meditation and of the transcendent and of different ways of regarding consciousness. You know, it, almost in the same way that they seem to intuitively understand technology. If you see a baby with an iPad, it's almost like they're born knowing how to work them. I think perhaps a similar <laughs> thing could be said with uh, the, the, the transcendent. This generation has come at the right time. They are ready for these techniques. They are ready to receive the world in a different way. They're preparing for a different type of consciousness. They're preparing for a different type of time. You travel all over the world, uh, <laughs> visit a lot of different cultures. How, how easy is it on a logistical level for you to get your two 20-minute sessions in a day? Well, Especially sometimes the one that's later in the day can be a challenge if I get caught up in things. But... I always get the first one in, and these days, while I'm spending more time deliberately reflecting and deliberately reconfiguring and giving my spiritual development some time, I am meditating twice a day. And in fact, Bob, I'm doing the uh, there's a, like a different course, isn't there? An advanced course. I think I'm doing that in May, where you can learn Great. some more techniques. Great. I'm very much looking forward to levitation, invisibility, <laughs> the power to fly. <laughs> if not being able to read their notes. So, like, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a, a lot to look forward to. Yeah, I, I make a place for it in my life because it's, <laughs> I suppose, one, it's very easy to live. You're encouraged to, in terms of materialistic pursuits kind of take care of themselves. The drive for procreation, for example, scarcely needs prodding. But the spiritual, it's nice to have regulation, particularly for people with addiction issues. It's nice to have a structured way of dealing with spiritual matters. For me, I know that twice a day I put aside 20 minutes to not be engaged with what other people think about me, what I think about other people, what I want, what I fear. But to access, I heard a wonderful quote, what is that? Consciousness is not just one more phenomena. Consciousness is the seat of all phenomena. And the idea that we have access to that ourselves, that we spend our, our time is in, inveigled by mundanity, tangled in tedium, and just a few incantations of a mantra away, you have access to the limitless. And it doesn't matter who you are, a completely non-discriminate force, something that is your birthright. Your own consciousness is your birthright. Yes, it's very important for people with addiction issues and possibly other mental health issues on Sure, I'm at least dual diagnosed. But for our species, for young people, for old people, for people that are suffering, for people that don't want to suffer, for people that want the world to change, for people that believe that the world can change, this technique is a significant tool. Thank you, Russell. I, I know... Um, Bob, how impactful is someone having someone like Russell Brand, who's one of the biggest stars in the world, biggest artists in the world, speaking so open? <laughs> yes. I've told Russell for a long time. When I taught Russell in, at uh, the Raj, which is a beautiful Ayurveda spa in Fairfield, Iowa, Maharshi Ayurveda Spa, and um, Candace Badgett is here from that, that spa. I taught Russell there, and when I was teaching him, I, I just had this thought. You know, so he said, 
this is a, a man who could, ch who could change the next generation because people trust Russell. They believe Russell. He tells the truth. He's honest. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought... Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 and I've been begging him to go on a tour of college campuses with me and with Dr. John Hagelin or David Lynch to talk to college students who have no vision. Really, they don't have the, they don't have the vision, but they don't have the, any input of something more and other. And so, Russell, when you finish this, um, this time within in London, then I would love to go on a tour of college campuses because College students love Russell Brand. And thank you yeah, for your yeah. message, and thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate this a lot. And I love you very much. Thank I love you, you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. I, I mean, I, I will say, and, and I'm sitting next to a media guru here, um, my first job in television was uh, courtesy of Roger Ailes, who is legendary for saying, sometimes the messenger is as important as the message. <laughs> yeah. And that is a perfect example. Someone like Russell Brand, who has the cool currency mm -hmm. to speak to an entire generation in a way that is relatable and actionable and impactful, is incredibly important. He, he was a heroin addict at 14 and a half. And he's been now clean, he's been meditating seven years, he's been clean for 12 years, but he said the, the five years before he started meditating was a real struggle. And he said that TM really uh, helped in an enormous way. And I think another thing that's wonderful about Russell is even when he's talking about consciousness and all these big issues, big picture, which actually is grounded in physics these days, is that he's letting another younger generation know there's something more than just the material. I think it's a very powerful message. Yeah. And I think you did a wonderful interview with oh. him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't Good know luck. what I was in yeah. for there, Mom. <laughs> so, um, Cindy, I just want to quickly give you a, a chance to just explain how you're using TM in your arsenal with your, with your population. And sure. Your so, so very often and most often, uh, my clients will sit down in front of me and whether it's early recovery, long-term recovery, the one thing that I hear most often is, I need something to help me with my anxiety, right? And I think one of the big disconnects in the medical community is that, you know, people with substance abuse issues is, that, you know, the, the immediate gratification, I'm in long-term recovery myself, the immediate gratification is a pill, a drink, or whatever it was, you know? Uh, you know, before I found recovery, I would pick up anything on the floor that somebody was using to quiet my mind. So, um, you know, as Bob said, I've already referred one of my clients to him last week who just struggled so much with his anxiety in and out of treatment centers well into his recovery, just looking for some type of relief from his anxiety. So I've already said to like two or three of my clients, okay, I, I found it for you. Great. TM is going to be the next tool in your toolbox. And I really think that that is going to be a good adjunct into whatever else they're doing for their recovery. Well, thank you for what you're doing, Bob. Thank you for what you're doing. I, I, want, I want to give you a chance. Speak about the philanthropic impact of getting behind a cause like TM, number one, and specifically um, why, why you have decided that David Lynch Foundation is the way to get that message out and, there. And your own experience with learning to meditate. Sure, so I, gotta, I have to back into that a little bit if you'll let me. Um, I, Bob mentioned the mission of the foundation, which is to help people lead lives free from the effects of alcohol addiction. Uh, what Bob did not mention is that I myself am an alcoholic, uh, and I am uh, one of the unfortunates that they talk about in the program uh, for whom Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't really work. Um, and so you know, my experience was that because it did not work for me, I was pretty much cast out. Uh, I was given no alternatives. And so over a, a very long period of time, I was able to cobble together a program of my own. I first was able to sort of reduce the harm of my drinking, uh, and now I'm able to remain abstinent for very long periods of time. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. But it was an excruciating process. 
Uh, and so I started the foundation two and a half years ago, kind of with the hope of helping others to maybe shorten that process a little bit. Uh, and so we've taken a, a, a two-fold approach to that. The first thing we've done is to create a really comprehensive guide online of every option that's available, uh, which I couldn't find when I was doing research. Hmm. So, you know, go to the site, that's where it is, criticize it, we need feedback, we keep it up to date all the time. Uh, and the other thing we do is make grants to people in the field who are trying to make a difference uh, in the hope of being a part of surfacing some more options. Uh, and one of our biggest grants to date is uh, the research we're doing on TM and recovery through Jan. That, that, thank you for sharing that. And I think that it is important, especially um, with the audience that we have here, um, which has, I think, a complete mixture of both experts and, and people on the same journey as you are, to, to hear that as recently as two and a half, three years ago, you couldn't find in this information age a menu of all of the options or tools that you could use, I think is, is shocking. Yeah. How, has, how has TM helped you? So I learned TM two years ago, um, and I would say that across the last 24 months, um, my brain has been completely rewired. Um, it's, it's, it's a good result. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. A good thing. <laughs> so um, I, I probably don't have to tell anybody here that the elimination of stress, of anxiety, of this massive internal tension uh, with which I seemed uh, to have been born is enormously beneficial when you're trying to avoid your drug of choice. So that's what it's done for me. Good for you. Jen, um, talk about the, the research that you're uh, involved with right now that you're leading. Uh, what's exciting you the most in this field? So we're leading a study with the generous support of the Dodge Foundation. Um, let me talk a little bit about what that um, study is and, and kind of what excites me most about TM in the addictions field. Um, you know, addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we face in the field um, that any clinician will tell you is that, you know, people tend to do really well when they're engaged in treatment. Um, the problem sets in when, um, you know, after tr treatment, we have very high rates of premature disengagement and very high rates of post-treatment relapse. Um, Depending on which epidemiological survey you look at, um, we have 22 to 24 million Americans who meet diagnostic thresholds for substance use disorder. 17 million of those are for alcohol. Um, at the same time, we're coming out of a uh, opioid epidemic in this country, the scope and severity of which is just completely unprecedented, and it's, it's ravaging communities. So, you know, there's a great need for expanding access to treatment and a great need for making sure that we can extend and enhance um, the benefits of treatment um, the, that we see once people are engaged. Um, so where I see kind of the greatest potential of TM is in interrupting that uh, post-treatment relapse process because we know that stress and craving play such a huge and outsized role in that whole cycle. Um, so the study that we're doing um, is uh, in an inpatient alcohol use disorder treatment facility uh, in Rockville, Maryland. It's a, um, uh, it's the, it has the highest throughput of primary alcohol use disorder um, patients coming through the facility in the state of Maryland. Um, and we are doing a feasibility study um, that uh, you know, for one year, we're integrating TM into the treatment milieu in that facility. Um, and we're looking at things like, is TM feasible to integrate into the treatment? Is it acceptable to patients? And then we're doing a quasi-experimental comparison, um, looking at um, uh, 30 patients who learn uh, the TM process um, and, and learn to do TM um, versus treatment as usual. Um, so we have a cohort of uh, patients who are getting treatment as usual, and then we're going to be comparing them to a cohort of patients who are getting 
transcendental meditation. You mentioned the opioid epidemic in this country, which has been in the news in the last week, uh, most recently uh, connected potentially with the, with the untimely death, death of Prince, as most people have heard. Uh, there's another epidemic in the country that I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit, the obesity epidemic. Um, and since there is some good data now that uh, there are some cases of refractory obesity that fall into an addictive pathway, especially with the dopamine reward center mm -hmm. in the brain, where you think, if at all, TM could have an application in compulsive eating disorders, obesity, um, from, with a central origin? So that's not exactly my area, but I think you're absolutely right, Jennifer, that it shares um, those similar kinds of um, pathways. And the nice thing about TM is that um, you know it it works right in theory. You know the the theory, the theoretical kind of basis of how it acts on the stress reward system um, is is such that you would plausibly expect some benefits. Now, in the realm of um, addictive disorders, um, you know, the, the fact is that the research that's out there, the clinical trials are fairly dated and clinical trial methodologies have really advanced <laughs> over the last 20 years. Um, so what our hope was with um, this study was to really lay the groundwork and foundation for um, what we hope will be a, you know, a, an opportunity to jumpstart um, more rigorous clinical trials uh, of TM in the future. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, alcohol use disorders, opioid use disorders, and um, you know maybe uh, expanding to other um, kind of uh, health behaviors um, or or chronic diseases that have such a uh, big behavioral aspect um, that uh, stress plays such a huge role in, Very which would include obesity. Peter, I want to thank you for your foundation's work and for sharing your story uh, with everyone here and wish you the best in you. continued TM practice and recovery. And, and Jan, thank you for the work you're doing. I, I think that the more we can bring good science and good data, again, there's no dearth of it for TM, but more is better mm -hmm. <laughs> in our world. Uh, the more that this will become really mainstream and I think it can help a, a number of people. Bob, you have quite a job to do. I'm glad you have Bring so much on. energy. <laughs> Thank you, John. Bob, nice meeting you. Yeah. You're going to go to the game tonight? Yeah, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> so, final panel are three very good friends who I realized I, all of them taught um, to meditate Johnny Podell, Matt Butler and the wonderful Ruby Warrington. Um, Ruby was just featured on The Doctors. Well, I'll say it in a moment. <laughs> um, just why don't you guys come on up, come on up. They they're all uh, had issues with um, addiction and have found the practice of transcendental meditation to be very valuable. And I'm going to let you um, let them introduce themselves. Okay, okay? perfect. But this is the great Johnny Sir, Pudel. Sir, we'll start this with you. This is the great Johnny Pudell. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name's Russell Brand. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I just want to say something. Could you imagine what he was like before he started no. meditating? <laughs> no. Could you imagine? Yeah. The greatest testament to oh TM. <laughs> the greatest testament. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've been in recovery uh, for four years. The amazing part, a lifetime struggle with um, substances and have had periods of recovery. In these four years... First, you had been in the music industry oh, yeah. for like <laughs> since the 1960s, high yeah. up managing and representing all the top acts in the world. Okay, go ahead. Right, and so four years ago I had a relapse due to just a simple surgery on my hand. Along came it, the pain meds. I knew it was a slippery slope. I did everything I could to avoid it, but I slid on my ass and wound up taking two to three hundred pain pills a week. Um, and it was a nightmare, and worse than 30 years ago when I had bottomed out on cocaine and heroin, and what it did to me. And anyway, I was fortunate enough, my children lovingly intervened, as children do, and off I went to rehab. And on the third day, it's a place called Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan, 
loved that place and very active. And on the third day, a, a volunteer came in, right while the Yankee game was on. He goes, hi, everybody. My name is Al, and I volunteer, and I'd like to teach you meditation. I'm going, Derek Jeter's at bat. Derek Jeter's at bat. <laughs> anyway, he taught it for three days, and the sky opened up. It would be, imagine if all of a sudden this roof opened up. That's what it did for me. And off I went on a spiritual journey when I got out, because I had also received the message there from my lifetime idol, Muhammad Ali, that service to others is our rent for being on the planet. And that said a lot. I wound up turning my back, not turning my back, but losing interest in my music career and was only interested in spiritual matters. And um, shortly thereafter, I came out. Um, I was introduced to Bob Roth on this little spiritual journey. You, know, you keep going, you meet this one, you meet that one. My whole language changed, you know. I thought a chakra was something sexual. I didn't even know, really, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> there is a piece of that, but I'll explain later. That's our fourth gynecologist. Oh, know. right, Perfect. right, right. I loved Elizabeth's book, Between the Breasts. I yeah. love that one. <laughs> <laughs> love that one. I'm going to be the first one to buy that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to call my memoir. Yeah. There you Clean go. The Spent a lot of Johnny? time there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm getting like Russell. I can't focus. <laughs> anyway, I was introduced to Bob Roth by my friend Natani, and he taught me TM. I've had an amazing experience. I never miss it. I have trouble also finding time for the afternoon one, but it's actually the best one because it resets yeah. your active day. You know, you meditate in the morning, everything, and then slowly the madness yeah. comes, the madness comes. And when I set the time at five, and who wants to set the time at five? You're busy. But when I do, it's reset, great. and I'm back to peace. Um, the one last thing I would say is, in the four years, I believe it's due to TM. I've never had a drug urge. I'm 70 years old. I never had a drugger in four years. It is an impossibility that I personally attribute to TM. So you know, I'm, you. I'm a clear fan. Good for you. Ruby, we met, Ruby, and oh, sorry, Tony. Yeah. We met in Los Angeles okay. when you came on the show, on my show, The Doctors mm -hmm. with Bob, and you had just started mm -hmm. learning TM. Tell us about why you chose to, why, why you were interested in learning TM and how it's been for you so far. Well, yeah, I think I was about three weeks in when we met. Mm -hmm. um, and similar to you, I, so I'm a journalist and I've been in lifestyle journalism for probably 17, 18 years now. Um, another high risk career for um, alcoholism or substance abuse, I've since learned actually, um, and had been wanting to learn a way to meditate, having first experienced meditation personally about six years ago, which coincided for me in a time in my life where I was very aware that my habitual drinking patterns, I'd never had a rock bottom, I never went into recovery, but I definitely was a habitual drinker in London as well, that would never have necessarily been questioned as a problem. Mm. Alcohol is very much <laughs> part of the um, culture there. And so I was drinking four to five, well, five to six nights a week, probably 20 to 30 drinks a week. Wasn't thinking of that as a problem. It was just part of my life. But coinciding with my first experience of mindfulness meditation, really beginning to realize the negative impact it was having on my overall well-being um, and wanting to do something about it had tried various different kinds of meditation over the years, mindfulness practice, Zen Buddhist meditation, um, sort of just very simple breathing meditations. Nothing had ever stuck. Um, and then similar again to you, various kind of different sources kept bringing me back to TM, to TM, to TM. And I was like, well, but I'd always been considered this is, this is like the real deal. This is twice a, twice a day, 40 minutes. Like, there's no way. Like, this is for, this is for saints. Only. Do you know what I mean? This is not going to work for me. If I can't even sit for five minutes and focus on my breathing, how am I going to do this? But I was like, okay, I'm going to, I, I just need to go there. I need to go there. So I did. And even after the first session, I felt this incredible just sense of peace and relaxation that was completely unavailable to me elsewhere in my life. Over that time period, by the way, I had massively, massively reduced my drinking on my own through my own kind of efforts. 
um, to, the, to, to where I wasn't really drinking at all. But occasionally, the, a craving would come in, and I was powerless against that. I recognized that. Um, but similarly, since beginning the Transcendental Meditation, the craving has just completely gone. It's almost like the final piece in the puzzle for me, in terms of that, my own struggle with with alcohol, yeah. And I'd like yeah. to just say here, it's not miraculous, it's right. not all this stuff. You know, people, I remember when I first heard about TM and I heard all this stuff, I thought, it just sounds, you know, it's like too good to be true or, what, you know, Kool-Aid they've taken. It's a mechanism, that's the point I want to make. This is a mechanism that we're all hard, hard wired for. This isn't a philosophy, this is, this is just accessing a mechanism to take profound rest at will and to access that level of the mind or consciousness, which we all have. And the ability to access it is not a learned, after two months, you finally get a hold of it. it it's immediate. It's, a, it's, a, it's just like a catalyst. So when you hear this, it's not like, well, this is better than that because I believe it. It's a physiological transformation. It's a change in the way your respiratory system functions, your digestive system functions, your cardiovascular system functions, your nervous system functions, very real. And, and uh, on, to that point, Bob, you know, with some of my patients that I have suggested uh, that they start TM, and I will often say, I'm going to write you a prescription, and they go, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I write, a new drug. <laughs> TM, twi BID, <laughs> 20 minutes, you know, and they look at it and they go, what, what, what is this? I didn't, what, is this new? Is this a new medication? And I say, no, no, you have to go and learn to do it and then do it twice a day. And um, I, I want your next big frontier to be actually in perimenopause and menopause because every single patient that I have suggested TM to with sleep difficulties and insomnia, which is another epidemic in this country, every single one of them has had an improvement in their sleep. So I think that that's, you know, just speaks to, again, there is a mechanism there. And every single one of them absolutely loves Jennifer no. Aston as the teacher. <laughs> no, they do. <laughs> I want to give the final word here, one minute before Je uh, Dr. Ashton and I close. Johnny, any final one minute, anything to say? Uh, Words are uh, brilliant. Can, yeah, the thing is, that Johnny could have had the whole two hours. So we're... we're, we're <laughs> Well, I would definitely say for any of you that have the issue of um, substances, that have the issue of anxiety, you know, a good question that I know the answer is medication or meditation. It's a choice. Quick fix, side effects. Interestingly enough, if you take pills, for those of you who share this addiction, the pills always take 20 minutes. So I sit there and I go, ah, so I'm not even losing any of that speed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Johnny. Johnny, thank well, you. Ruby, thank you. Matt, thank you, thank you. so much. You know, Bob, I, I thought you outdid yourself, first of all, you and your staff, and I, I want to thank the staff from uh, David Lynch Foundation. Are the staff here, could they stand for a second? They're, they're all working. They're okay. working. But um, you put together really incredible panelists who all shared from very different and, and intimate and personal angles and professional angles, uh, their thoughts and their experience with transcendental meditation. And, um, and I, I echo a lot of their, a lot of their feelings. I um, have never had an addiction or substance abuse problem, but, and, but as I said, I have a lot of patients who do. Um, most notably, I saw a patient recently who uh, while driving impaired, uh, struck and killed a young woman. And when she said, when she told me what happened, she was seated this far away from me and she said, I, I killed someone because I was driving drunk and left a 
two-year-old without a mother as a result. And so I know a lot of people in this audience are really in the trenches on one way or another in a variety of ways uh, dealing with this population. But I know as an individual and as a doctor that the benefits of TM and the accessibility and the ease, I, I keep going back to that truly holistic wellness practice, which whether you're using it as a therapeutic modality uh, to treat an issue that could be life-threatening or whether you're doing it to augment all or complete your wellness routine, I don't think it's an option anymore in this day and age. It's not a luxury, uh, it's it's not not a luxury and it's not, um, it's not a matter of how am I gonna find the time. Um, again, just think of that great George Stephanopoulos. If he can find the time at 2.30 in the morning, all of us in this room can find the time. And uh, I just look forward to, to seeing the, the impact of TM more and more uh, on children. I'm particularly interested in athletes and the mind-body connection. I know that, that uh, transcendental meditation is being used in sports psychology and athletes, at-risk population, women, children, veterans, substance abuse, addiction, recovery, I think the list goes on and on, cardiovascular well-being, stress reduction. Um, I just encourage everyone here, if you're, if you're still a TM virgin, <laughs> it's the last time, uh, <laughs> uh, I would really- Lucky was she wasn't a podiatrist. Oh my God, <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> Where would we go um, with that one? <laughs> I, I just think that, that the foundation, and you have done amazing work, and I just want to end by saying, you, you know, you, you're an incredibly modest person, but um, as anyone who's read the program, if they don't know of your name before coming into this room, you are the preeminent transcendental meditation, meditation teacher in this country, if not in the world. But you are always quick to say, it's not just they have to learn from you. Any certified licensed transcendental meditation teacher um, will get you the same results. And I, and I thank exactly. you for, for everything you've done. You're an incredible spokesperson for this. First of all, is there any better host, moderator, facilitator? <laughs> Jesse and I were waiting. We were getting messages um, because she was, Jen was stuck in traffic on the West Side Highway. And then you like ran? Yeah, I just, in the heels. I just ran the heels to get her. <laughs> and just walked right up on stage. I'm up here opening and just sort of jabbering away. You just came up so, just smooth and just so. That's because I did my, my 20 minutes in the car. <laughs> in car. <laughs> in Two hours yeah, in the car, right. yeah. Um, it is true that that there are thousands of certified teachers of transcendental meditation in the United States and all over the world. And it is true that this is taught in a systematic way that science can evaluate and compare and contrast. And it is true that it does access a, a, a mechanism that is within every human being. I mean, I love teaching 10-year-old children and the whole David Lynch Foundation, 10-year-old children at a school in the Bronx who's never heard the word meditation before, and they have these exact same experiences that any of the people you heard on stage. Or usually it's a, a wife who learns to meditate and then drags their husband in or partner in to learn, and they're just sitting there like this, you know, they're just so skeptical and, you know, like, what am I doing here? And I just think, you know, bring it, bring it on again. <laughs> you know, you don't have to believe in gravity and this, you know, it falls. And so the technique works, it's available to everyone. And I would just conclude by saying that I had a very interesting experience, which I told Rona Abramson about, um, talking to the, one of the directors of the UN Women about the problem and the concern of trauma and toxic stress among women in developing countries. And, I mean, in Africa is horrific. And, um, she said to me, she said, well, you know, wh what is your vision for the foundation? Uh, you know, how many people, and I just said, you know, I, I like to teach a million, we like to teach our women's initiative of a million women in Africa over the next 10 years, you know, just thinking. And she said, you're thinking too small. 
there are hundreds of millions of women who suffer, billion women who suffer from trauma and toxic stress. And there is no medicine they can take to prevent it, and there's no medicine they can take to cure it. It's a nightmare. She said, you need to think much bigger. Come to me when you have a plan to teach 100 million people, women, to meditate. So usually people don't tell me that I think too small. No. <laughs> and, uh, so I came back to the office. This is actually coming somewhere, this story. Um, I came back to the office, and I started telling some people in the office, and, and uh, you know, they said 100 million. It's, <laughs> pretty big. Um, so two weeks later, I had taught Elon Musk to meditate, you know, uh, Tesla and SpaceX. Now there's a guy who thinks big. And so I taught him to meditate and he said, so what's the plan for the David Lynch Foundation? And I, I said, um, I'll go with this. I said, we'd like to teach 100 million people to meditate. Because if you think about it, to teach a person to meditate, we don't have to build buildings. We don't, not a pill. It's not a technology. It's just whispering. This, training the teachers to whisper this information to that, to, to this person. That's it. So I said, I'd like to teach 100 million people to meditate, you know, in the next 10 years. And he said, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, you know, SpaceX. So I said, well, you know, like, what He your... said on this planet. Yeah, no. What about so the he other said, <laughs> So I said, you know, well, okay, Elon, you know, what's, what's your plan? He said, I want to colonize Mars. <laughs> 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 and I thought, and he was serious. He also said, great thing of Elon, he said he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a guy who loves TM. He loves his meditation. And I thought, we have something that's a missing element here. Everything that people are doing is, you know, if it's with genuineness, it's good. We need, we need to continue. This is not an either or, but this is something that's missing. And that missing element is to access that field of consciousness, that silence which exists within everyone, and reset and rebalance. And so thank you all very, very much for coming. You have Ina, Ina Clark, who's our director of philanthropy, will want me to say you have on your brochure if you, in your packet if you want to help support this work. You, any, we're a 501c3, any donation is welcome. And if you want to learn to meditate, you'll get an email or something about how you could learn. But the last thing I'd say is it's now up to you. you know, I mean, every person hears it. We make our own decisions. If this is something that you think is valuable, we're more than welcome to help you in any way we can. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, our thank speakers. You, Bob. Thank you. Oh.